I'm going to try to do this without a mic. If that's a problem for people in the back, let me know. I've never been accused of being soft-voiced, so that shouldn't be a problem. Thanks for coming to what I promise you will be the least visual presentation in the history of Creative Mornings, and obviously the least technologically sophisticated. I want to, I want to start by talking about how I got interested in the questions that I'm going to be addressing this morning. And it, it happened because I moved to Portland. I moved to Portland four years ago from Connecticut possibly the least happening place in America. <laughs> and I suddenly found myself immer immersed in, you know, hipster central. I know, I, I, I'll try not to use the word hipster because I know hipsters don't like being called hipsters. So I'll say, uh, I'll say Gen Y or I'll, I'll, say, I'll say millennial. So I saw millennial style culture all around me. You know, uh, you know better than me, the, the hats and the skinny jeans and the wall-to-wall -wall tattoos and the, and it was, I mean, visually very interesting. But um, what, I, what I really wanted to try to understand was what does it mean? Like, what is it saying? What values does that style embody? Um, you know, what, what attitude about the world? Um, so in, in order to try to get a handle on that, I, I I thought about, well, what do earlier youth cultures mean? You know, beatniks, hippies, punks, slackers. What does it even mean to talk about what does a style or a culture mean? So in order to simplify the question a little bit, I thought, well, let's just talk about, in, for any of those cultures, what uh, emotion or affect is most uh, valued or idealized, because there's always there's always some feeling that you're supposed to be feeling. And also, what, uh, what is the image that that culture has about the world that it wants to create, or the thing that it wants to create in the world? In other words, who do you want to be, and how do you want to put that into the world? In order, to, I, in order to explain what I mean, I think it'll be easier if I talk about, I think the hippies are the easiest example, because the, uh, the approved emotion was love, right? It was all about love. Summer of love, all you need is love, right? Um, and the social form that that was going to take, the social form that sort of is most characteristic of, of hippiedom was utopia. Like, a, like the commune is the most obvious example, but also the music festival there were sort of temporary utopias. In some ways, Woodstock, while it was commercialized, was sort of the apotheosis of, of, of all of that. So love, utopia. If you go back to the beatniks, the emotion was ecstasy, I think, like the perfect moment that Kerouac talks about. And it makes perfect sense that they, um, that they were really into jazz, right? This sort of very in the moment kind of spontaneous uh, uh, music. Um, in terms of the social form, I would say that for, for, for the beatniks, it was individual transcendence. It was, it was that sort of individual experience. The punks are easy, right? The emotion was rage, was anger, and this, the social form was kind of an anti-form. It was nihilism. It was destruction, right? They were very clear about that. Slackers, another interesting case, that the emotion there was like was disaffection, was angst, was apathy, and as a result, if you, it took me a long time to figure out what their social form was, and I realized no, the whole point was that it was a withdrawal from any kind of commitment, right? Whatever, right? That was the big slacker word, whatever. We're not going to commit to any kind of vision or any kind of thing. OK. So that gave me some, con some conceptual categories to work with as I thought about this. And I thought about, well, affect. You know, uh, I thought about the young people I knew, not only the ones I was meeting here, but also those kids that I, I taught at Yale for a long time. And I thought, you know, they're all incredibly nice. They're all, like, polite. 
well-spoken, pleasant, moderate, earnest. And then I started, you know, in my, like my getting on to middle age sort of bourgeois way to like, <laughs> like on the Colbert Report, like sometimes there'd be, there'd be like Vampire Weekend or some other young rockers. And I thought, you know, like these guys are not acting like, like the rockers that I'm, you know, like you're, you're supposed to be like a chest beating egomaniac who like <laughs> trashes your hotel room and talks about how many groupies you sleep with. And these guys were all, or women, they were all like low key, self-deprecating, you know, like post-ironic, very earnest, very eco-friendly sort of presentation, you know. <laughs> like almost um, uh, an unwillingness even to display ambition. You know, it's all gonna be kind of communal and groovy and, you know, no anger, no edge, no ego. Um, there was a professor at Yale who used to tell his classes that they belong to a post-emotional generation. <laughs> so I sort of was thinking about that. And then I also thought about, well, so that's the affect, that's the emotion, that, that complex of sort of things. Then I thought about, well, what am I, what do I see, when I look around myself in the city or even in the country, here are the kinds of things that most jump out at me. I see food carts, boutique pickle companies, <laughs> boutiques, techie startups, urban farming supply stores, hipsters making wallets out of recycled plastic, bottled water that wants to save the planet, website ventures. And then I realized that the, that the social form, the millennial social form, is it was right in front of me all, all along and I, I couldn't see it because I was looking for something a little more visionary, but it's in fact the small business, I think. And that also includes nonprofits, right? It's not about the money, it's about, well, you know what it's about. Um, but it, it, it's like every artistic or moral aspiration is now expressed in terms of starting your own business, whether it's food or music or good works. I had a former student who was in a band and like, he like finally left because he, he said, you know, it's like they want a reality show. It's this, it's this thing, the, the label in other words, it's this all consuming sort of, it's not like you make your music, but it's this all consuming kind of enterprise. Uh, so I wrote the article that Celie ref referred to and the label that I used for this new generation was generation, is generation cell. Uh, okay, perhaps not calculated to win friends, I, but, but the point was, uh, the point was uh, to put a name on this new entrepreneurial ideal for generation Y. Now, I wanna say first of all that entrepreneurialism isn't necessarily bad, okay? But I'm just struck by the fact that it seems to be the ideal. First of all, if you go back 40 years, or even 20 years, a young person's first thought was not, I'm gonna start a business, okay? I think not even their second or third thought would have been, I'm gonna start a business. We used to talk about something known as selling out. It was a bad thing. I think it's really interesting that that phrase has completely dropped out of our vocabulary because it's just sort of what we all do, right? We're not really, so there's no out, it's just selling, right? There's no, there's no position from which selling can be seen as selling out. It's just what everybody does. My point is selling entrepreneurialism isn't bad. What bothers me is that it has become the exclusive ideal, the horizon of possibility. But let me hasten to add that this is far from only true of young people, of Generation Y or Millennials. I think the small business has become the idealized social form or life expression of our time in general. That's why I say that I think the characteristic form of our, of our age may be the business plan. It seems to be the thing in which we most invest our imagination. If you think, uh, if you think back a century ago to the, to the heyday of uh, high modernism and aestheticism, art for art's sake, the artist as sort of the, the culture hero, at least for a certain section of a culture, all of the attributes that were attached to being an artist or to making art then are now attached 
to entrepreneurialism now, like autonomy, freedom, heroism, imagination, creativity, adventure. And it's not just in America either. I was talking with someone in Singapore a few days ago and she said the same complex of ideas come out when you talk to, to young people in Singapore about what they want to do. It's all sort of, it's the same ideology. Uh, and it's also the ideology we hear coming out, I know mostly from Republican politicians, entrepreneurs, hero, her, the heroic entrepreneur, the job creator. But I think one of the reasons that language can have so much traction is because it's kind of become a generally accepted ideal or ideal or I would say myth in our society. The moment where, the, where it all clicked for me was when I realized that the affect that I described before and the, the social form that I just finished describing absolutely go together. The affect that I described before, the affect that we all have now is the salesman's personality. It's the smile and shoe shine. It's the customer's always right. It's I'm not going to offend anybody because I don't know whether I'm going to want to sell them something or do business with them. I don't know who they're, you know, when I'm going to run into them down the road. And even if we're not literally selling something, although more and more of us are because of social media, because we're on social media, we are, all of us, at least selling one thing, which is ourselves. The contemporary self is an entrepreneurial self, a self that's packaged to be sold. Okay, so I put this article out there, and as you can imagine, there was a little bit of blowback, especially from <laughs> young people. And I should just say personally that if I were a young person, I'd be pretty sick of old idiots talking about young people, so I totally get that. <laughs> One person said, we're not generation sell, we're generation make, okay? Independent creativity, fueled by the web, that's what we're about. Another person said, it's not generation sell, it's generation fix, okay? All of this selling, all this entrepreneurialism is about trying to change the world. That's what's motivating it. And I think they were right. I think that I missed some big pieces out of this when I first wrote the article. And I think you can even put the three concepts together and say that young people today think in terms of fixing the world by making things and selling them. And so selling them is just sort of the necessary <laughs> endpoint of the process. Does that, does that describe some of you? <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to say in passing, and I think it's important uh, to note this for a number of reasons, that's actually not a new idea. Twelve years ago, David Brooks wrote Bobos in Paradise, coined the term Bobos, bourgeois bohemians, describing a phenomenon he had already seen, you know, from the early 90s, which is about exactly the same thing. It's really a late boomer idea uh, of creative entrepreneurship and sort of social change and having a groovy lifestyle but being able to make money. And basically, the bohemian values of the counterculture in the 60s merged as the boomers kind of grew up and started to make money with bourgeois values of material comfort and success. Okay, that's exactly what we're seeing now. It's just we're seeing a lot more of it because kids grew up with it and because it's fueled by the web. Um, millennials like to define themselves against the boomers, at least the, the ones who wrote to me did, uh, which makes sense because boomers are their parents. But I, I think there's a, <laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, similarities, really. The same idealism, the same countercultural mindset, but also the same self-regard, self-absorption, self-congratulation, possibly. Okay. <laughs> But I think there's some problems with all, despite the fact that I accept the critiques that were made, I still think there's some problems with this entrepreneurial ideal. So first of all, I'm gonna to suggest to you that selling is inherently corrupting. Selling is not just here I have this thing, I have an idea, I'm gonna give it form and I'm gonna get people interested in it and get some money for it so I can do some more stuff. That's the heart of it maybe, but there's packaging. There's advertising, there's marketing, with the web more and more all the time. And all of those aspects of the process are designed to create the illusion of value. That doesn't mean that there isn't real value in what someone's doing underneath. But all of those things, maybe not for everybody, but I think it seeps in, even almost when, without your realizing it, and I think anyone who's done it and thought honestly about it knows that 
packaging, marketing, advertising are all designed to at least create the illusion of additional value. Now people have said to me, hey, but it's not like that now because we're marketing in social networks and social networks are, they make it better. Social networks are more, off okay. <laughs> To me, it makes it worse. First of all, because it means that commercial values are infiltrating spaces that were previously free of them. In other words, our personal relationships. Like, someone who I thought was my friend is like trying to sell me shit now. I didn't really see that one coming. <laughs> but you know, the buzzword now is authenticity. Somebody I was talking to about this said, no, you don't understand, people are great bullshit detectors. And I'm like, really? People are great bullshit detectors? I think the whole, I think all of commerce is predicated on the notion that people are terrible bullshit <laughs> <laughs> And he said, oh, he said, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> so I think that the rhetoric of authenticity that's grown up around the web is just a more insidious form of commercialism. David Foster Wallace who unfortunately died before he could really see all this. I would have loved to know what he, what he thought of it. Just talking about uh, 90s irony, sort of David Letterman TV culture, he said, look, when everybody's hip to the pitch, the pip pitch just has disguises itself as an anti-pitch. The hip commercials, the perhaps Nike commercials, you know, that's, you know, so I say, you know, authenticity, my ass. <laughs> To paraphrase the Big Lebowski, the pitch abides, right? The pitch is not going to go away. It's just going to, it's just going to, okay, so that's, that's first of all. <laughs> Second of all, what does entrepreneurial culture do to the people who don't like to sell? Creators who, who aren't good at selling themselves, who feel that it saps their time, their energy, their spirit. You know, like if Kafka had to maintain a Facebook page, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, or, you know, like Beethoven's Twitter feed. I mean, um, everybody complains about agents and managers and producers, and in a lot of ways they're a big pain in the ass, but they have the advantage of, of uh, as we move away from all of that, towards everybody has to, you know, be their own, because all those institutions are going away, all the publishing companies and music companies, so we're all going to do it ourselves. But the fact is that those kinds of people do professionally what a lot of us don't want to have to do and aren't very good at. You know, and relieve us from the burden of worrying about all that stuff if we're not good at it. And then there are the creators who are good at it, but they're not good at creating, <laughs> right? There are people like that too. I'm sure we all know some of them. The more selling becomes central to the process, the less it's, we can delegate it to other people, the more the system is going to reward people who are good at selling. As I hope Celie doesn't mind my quoting one of, her one of our conversations, she said, look, artists and salespeople are fundamentally different kind of people. It's the nature of being an artist to be consumed always with doubt. That's what fuels your exploration. And it's the nature of being a salesperson to suppress all doubt and to speak in exclamation points, <laughs> right? So now they have, those functions have to coexist in the same person. But here we start to get to the heart of the matter, which is that selling corrupts the product itself. Now, if we're just talking about like a gadget, a phone, maybe that's not an issue. But remember, we're not just talking about that. The whole premise of the response to my article was, we're selling in order to change the world. This is selling as counterculture, as dissent, as revolution. And to me, that's a contradiction in terms. Because when you need to sell, you need to act like I was talking about before. You need to please the customer, to be affable, to fulfill their expectations. What we have, in other words, is a loss of the avant-garde. And I'm defining avant-garde not in terms of experimentation, or, uh, for example, but specifically art that offers resistance to its audience. Art that is not easily consumable. And not just art. You know, I'm sort of in the business of the business. I'm in the business of social criticism. It's the same thing. We don't really have an avant-garde of thought either. Because if you make people uncomfortable, which is what avant-garde art and thought has to do, 
then they're not going to want to buy, in either sense, what you're selling them. So we tone it down, you know? We sort of tart it up. We put in a dance beat. We, <laughs> you know, stay within acceptable moral and aesthetic limits. Maybe, you know, we, we try to surprise a little bit, but we surprise in a way that we know is not going to be disturbing. There's that famous book about the modernist art called The Shock of the New. I don't think anyone thinks in terms of shocking the audience anymore. It's been said by many people, I'm hardly the first one, that for a long time we have not had an avant-garde. Not just in painting, the art in which that term is most often used, but even in style. You know, Kurt Anderson wrote a piece that Seeley uh, alerted me to about how if you look back at the way young people, hip, stylish people dressed 20 years ago, they dressed the same. But if you go, as they do now, but if you go 20 years before that, it's totally different. And 20 years before that, it's totally different. But it seems like we've plateaued. It seems like there's no real innovation in that, in that realm. We recycle, we sample, we do remakes, we do remixes, we make sequels. We are always presenting something that is in some way familiar to the audience because we know it's already sold. It has a track record. Julian Barnes, the English novelist, said, 12 years ago, that he sees a lack of real ambition among young novelists because they just want to sell. P.J. O'Rourke, the uh, satirist and social critic, said, quote, we seem to have entered a deeply unimaginative era. Let us not confuse imagination with innovation and even progress. And he contrasted our time to the Renaissance. And you can think about something like Leonardo's helicopter which was never going to get built for several hundred years, but he spent all that time thinking about it, dreaming about it, designing it. Gary Kasparov, the former world chess champion who's now a writer and political activist, wrote, we have discarded creativity in exchange for a steady supply of marketable products. Just a few days ago, Nicholas Carr, who's a critic of technology culture, he wrote The Shallows about the internet. He wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about how our innovation has become really small bore. And his example was Instagram, which as he put it is a, is a product that makes pictures look like older pictures <laughs> and which sold for a billion dollars. His explanation for why innovation has become small bore is really kind of, I, I felt over ingenious and I'm not gonna share it with you. To me, I thought the, uh, the explanation was kind of obvious, which is that everything is being created for the consumer market. So it's going to be small board. It's going to be something you can hold in your hand or put in your house or put on your phone or whatever. The kinds of innovation he talked about, like building the electric power grid, as we did early in the 20th century, were, were often public projects publicly funded that benefited everybody and were necessarily on a huge scale. I mean, you can think about the space program. We don't do those things anymore. There are political reasons for it. But even universities have cut way back on basic research in favor of applied technology because it makes them a lot of money. This has become a big thing in the university world. It's called technology transfer. And the greatest example, the, the thing that everyone else wants to emulate, is the MIT Media Lab. Uh, there's a great article about the MIT Media Lab in the first issue of The Baffler, the relaunched satirical magazine, The Baffler, that, that started publication again a few months ago. Their first issue had something about the MIT Media Lab, and it mentioned some of the projects they have in development, like uh, wristbands that tell you your mood, as if you needed a wristband to tell you your mood. Electronic tambourines that light up even though they don't have a battery. Uh, toothpaste that tells you today's weather as you're brushing your teeth in the morning. Uh, um, as the article brought out really beautifully, the avant-garde has been co-opted by commerce. The notion of creativity has become identified with the idea of technology, and the technology has been identified with products. Instead of being mobilized as citizens the way the avant-garde wanted to, we are being marketed to as consumers. One final example, there was an NPR story a few weeks ago about uh, incredibly sophisticated body scanners that are going to help us, uh, they're going to help us choose clothes that fit better. You know, so this enormous amount of technological ingenuity to help us, you know, look good at a party. Um, and that's when I realized that what we're doing is inventing cooler and cooler ways to do exactly what we're doing already. We take the world we have as a given and try to engineer it a little bit better. 
One of the people who wrote to me uh, as a result of my article, young guy, said, our generation understands that society is driven by consumption on every level. And I thought, isn't that exactly what we have to question? Is it really countercultural to sell hipster pickles to your parents? We're not doing what the avant-garde is supposed to do, which is to challenge the basic social, political, and economic structure of our world, reimagine and reinvent our social relationships. We're thinking about how we can get clean drinking water to people in Somalia, which is great and noble and admirable, but we're not thinking about how Somalia's happened in the first place and what we can do to change that. I think it's interesting that that generation why that millennial social ideal of the small business, it's, it's not a very ideal ideal. You know, utopia or nihilism or individual transcendence, those were like things that were never really going to be achieved. Our ideal is, is actually, it's, it's just a thing. It's not really an ideal. And I also think it's interesting that the Generation Y style doesn't really embody anything. I mean, the hippies wore clothes that said love, you know, loose, soft, flowing. The punks wore accessories that said rage and hate. What does hipster style say? I think it just says, I'm hip. It doesn't really say anything more than that. OK, so last point. The ethos, this is my last criticism, the ethos of do-it-yourself social engagement goes along also with a withdrawal from politics, which is inherently a sphere of two things that millennials say they hate, and not just millennials, conflict and large institutions. <laughs> I said that um, this idea has really been around for a while, this thing that Brooks, David Brooks called boboism, this idea of creative entrepreneur, blah, 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 at least you know, 20 years. Ask yourself how things have changed in terms of technology and food in the last 20 years, say, which is great, that's fantastic. Technology is you know, awesome, food, we have so many choices, it's so cool. OK, and then ask yourself how things have changed in the last 20 years in terms of politics and economics which is things are a disaster and they're getting worse all the time. The idea of creative social change is that what starts at the edges will go to the center. But I think unless we engage politics directly, what starts at the edges will stay at the edges because there's always going to be some asshole like Mitch McConnell standing there with his arms folded. And we could open all the organic ice cream stores we want, but we couldn't get Congress, we couldn't stop Congress from declaring pizza sauce a vegetable. You know, we couldn't do anything about the farm bill. Against the immense power of coordinated wealth, the Walmarts, the Goldman Sachses, the Koch brothers, the small business model does not amount to very much. I don't think you can change the system either by just working within it or another response dropping out of it. I think you can only change it by confronting it directly. Thank you. Right. I'm, I'm curious as to sort of what you think is after capitalism or what you think we should be doing to get that. Um, first of all, I take your, your first point that people are doing this because they want to make a living. Uh, they see they don't want to be part of the industrial machine. And for the individual, I mean, I'm not, I'm not questioning, I'm not denigrating that choice. Um, yes, it's, to your second point, it's, it's said that the system we have is not sustainable. Um, uh, a system ba based on, on endless growth. I'm not, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a critic. I think I'm a very bad prognos prognosticator. And I think, I've been asking, I'll just say that I've been asking the same question you've been asking of the friend, my friends who are farther to the left than me. Uh, what's going to replace capitalism? What do you have to offer? What's the vision? And unfortunately, I think it speaks to our crisis that no one's really come up with a good answer. 
I mean, there's, there, there are anarchist uh, impulses out there. I think it's kind of unrealistic to think that we're all going to have small, you know, like small-scale farming communities. And quite frankly, I'm not sure we really would want to live with what that would entail. Um, it's, I, I'm not going to even pretend to try to have a good answer to that. Honestly, go ahead. Uh, we had to be the hippies, the punks, the hipsters. What do you see as anarchists? Well, right, right. Well, the, that's a good question, but the thing is that if you look back on all, all of those, they only lasted a few years, really, in their heyday, even though there's so hippies staying around. And the hipster's been around for like 15 years, right? And it's sort of what Kurt Anderson said. It's like, it, we're just kind of flatlined. Because the thing is, let me just say quickly that the hipster, despite, I'm going to go back to the thing that people really got angry at me about. It's not fundamentally countercultural because, um, like, the mainstream is hip, too. There's a symbiosis now between youth culture. It's like the hip young person who's selling me my latte, like we're all kind of on the same page, we're all kind of cool, right? So, you see well, you know, I, wrote, I ended up publishing that piece like two weeks after Occupy started and everyone said like, you're out of date already, it's a, it's a new world. And I would like to believe, I would like to believe that. I would like to believe that that is the start of something different. Well, we're just gonna have to see. Thanks for being here, thanks for the insight. I'd like to ask if the actual juxtaposition you're trying to make is one that's basically reserved for the political venues, which is to say your concept of the public is something altruistic and that the market is something negative and transactional. But I might ask, have you ever conceived of a public venue as rather one of coercion, where people are forced to fund it and then forced to live by its rules, whether they're an electrical grid or any other norm, and that the cell generation is actually one of peaceful transactions entered into by people who have choice to enter them. Um, what I would say, I may not be hitting your, your question squarely on the nose, but I think I'm getting the spirit, is that I don't see a choice between people and government. I see a choice between corporations and government. Government is fucked up, and it's getting worse all the time. To me, if we don't have government, we have what we have because we've had increasingly, we've had decreasingly, we've had increasingly less government. We've had less and less government for 30 years. Less regulation, less enforcement of regulation. Just open the business pages on any day. It's a parade of corporate criminality that can only be held in check by a government. Now, I think we need to recapture our government. And I think that maybe a country with 300 million people, maybe that's inherently problematic. But that's my answer to you. I mean, if we have this sort of, what I take it you were suggesting as a kind of libertarian free, um, free field, it will quickly become dominated. It is already dominated by very large actors over whom we really have no control. Yeah. Why which group? Why, uh, like oh, oh, right. Oh, okay, because they're all completely corrupt, right? I mean, it's incredibly, um, all of... There's no interest at all. Right, I mean, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I look, when I look at sort of uh, students of mine, what the career choices they're making, I mean, uh, all of the things that are, that are fun and cool about the idea of entrepreneurialism, like all those things like autonomy and all that stuff and making a difference, like none of that happens in the institutional sphere. It's like this long slog, full of compromises, incremental, it's not fun. I think that's why. Yeah. So I wonder if you could comment on the idea of how your thesis embraces the idea that we live in the age of the TED Talk, where the, uh, the, the product is just a sort of clever idea or moment of insight and nothing substantially more. Can you repeat the question? It's about the t TED Talks and how they fit into my thesis. Could you, I'm not actually sure, uh, I mean, could you say more about? Uh, so I, I read an article about yeah. the idea that the TED Talk, which is becoming more pervasive and popular, is really, it seems to have something to do with the idea of the perfect moment. Uh -huh. it, it, it lasts for the duration of the person's stage. Right, stays, right, 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 talk. right. Look, I mean, I, uh, I don't, Actually, no, I, didn't, I haven't read much about TED. I haven't, I, I'm not, it's not a world that I'm part, that I'm part of. Um, it sounds like a good thing. I mean, I'm not here to say that everything is terrible. And I think that, um, <laughs> although I know it, it probably sounds like that, 
And maybe, you know, and look, I mean, people have also said to me that we're trying to get away from the profit motive and, and there's a certain amount of gift culture. People have said that about Portland. I mean, this is what we're doing here now. So that, I think it's a good thing. That's all I'm going to say. Go ahead. So you mentioned that selling is inherently corrupted or it can corrupt a product. And I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> and I think that, you know, there's people like Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia who created cleaner climbing gear to help improve the world, fix it, make it better. Right. Inevitably, that he, he reluctantly became an entrepreneur and created a strong brand. And right. his model is buy a high quality backpack and it'll last a longer time instead of consumerism, you know, where you're just buying a lot. How do you think that model and that company and other companies like it that are conscious capitalists fit into your right. uh, philosophy right. ideas. Well, look, I mean, that's the, that's the model. That's the ideal. And again, I mean, I think, that, um, uh, I think that if you actively and continuously fight against the tendencies that selling is going to produce, that you can do something good. And, uh, I think what bothers me the most, like I said, is that this is the way in terms, in, these are the terms in which we all have to think all the time. And also, as I'm sure you know, uh, people can fake it, right? You know, whether it's organic food that, that's not really organic, what does that mean? Or practices, you know? So, yeah. So Good. a lot of people can fake it, but what do you think is sincere and noble and genuine in, in your, you know, what companies are doing it right? Oh, I, 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 you know better than I. I'm not really, seriously, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to try to, uh, go outside of my, my area of expertise. I, I think it's possible. I do think it's possible. Um, that was the idea to begin with. Um, I just think that A, we need to be vigilant, and B, it's that other question, the larger question, which is, is there a problem with the whole system? You know? Uh, I'm not sure who's next, so go ahead. This actually goes right along with what he's saying. Yeah. What's your take on uh, like social entrepreneurism and business models that are ingrained around, like Tom's Shoes, for instance, their business model is based off of you buy this, we give this type of idea and how that's growing and kind of a newish type of thing. You know, I, 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 I feel like you're, you're asking me, like I actually know that, you know, you're asking me all these questions like I'm the, you know, I know what the hell I'm talking about, but. Um, <laughs> sure you do. Um, let me, again, I mean, it's good. But it's good within certain bounds. Um, it's kind of like, it's maybe an inherently exploitative system, but we're going to take some of our profits and, you know. It's also what we used to do publicly, collectively, to, to return to the libertarian question. But we now have to rely on the benevolence of entrepreneurs to do it for us, which also really bothers me. Um, especially because, as this election is showing us, most of them are not benevolent. Right. You. So I grew up in an entrepreneur home, and I was always like, I'm never going to do what my dad did because life kind of sucked, having you know siblings and my dad working forever and never being home with the children to make us survive. But time was different when I was growing up. I always thought I was going to get a job that gave me insurance and that I was going to be awesome and I'd go to college and it all work out. And then as soon as I get to college, it's like, guess what? You're not going to have a job doing anything that you love. <laughs> and now you're $8,000 in debt, so what are you going to do with yourself? And so I think that, not to say anything against you, but you were in a different time. And you had a tenureship. You had a job that was going to be locked in. And that I didn't, but but I had a I had a job at least. Yeah. Like it's completely different. Right. So I think that that needs right. to be acknowledged. That right. Now we don't have jobs, so right. it's like, what are we going to do? We should make something we love. Right. And try to change like the immediate community around us, but when we can't even feed ourselves, how are we supposed to feed people? Look, uh, uh, you, you, that's a really good point. And it, that was actually one, one of the other big responses to the article. Like, we were doing this because we have to. Uh, I'm only going to say, OK, but this, is, this long predates the financial collapse, this whole ethos, this whole spirit. But look, you're right. And, and as I said before, people have to you know, make their way in the world. And it seems like the jobs are drying up. I, I, I think, 
I think that we're, we're, too, we're more pessimistic than we need to be right now, just as we were way more optimistic than we should have been 10 years ago. And they're still, you know, jobs are hard, but it's not like they don't exist. And um, especially among college students, at least in certain kinds of schools, there's this founder's syndrome where it's not even good enough to join someone else's thing. You have to do your own thing. So I think in some ways it plays into an illusion of agency, like this is the, you know, but, I, but I look, I mean, I hear what you're saying. And again, I'm not condemning anybody from doing it. I'm I mean, I would love to work for someone. Okay, no, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I do have a full-time job, you know, but it's like, okay. when I graduated college, I was like, man, all I want is to work for someone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a, as easy as it was, and I mean, you can still do it, but it takes a whole different kind of person to even get a job at a certain pay that it uses. Interesting. Um, uh, I, never, I would never pretend that any of these choices or any of these issues are easy. Um, uh, go ahead. It seems like in, in Portland in particular, there's, and particularly in the creative community in Portland, there is sort of a sustainability to the way freelancers work and interact with each other. So that the, it, it might be monotonous, and we might not be at, at sort of, you know, Da Vinci levels of art creation necessarily, <laughs> but there is something that, that seems like, you know, that, that, that it's been going on for a while. People get projects. Oh, I have more projects than I can handle. I've got a friend who can do that kind of thing. I'll refer this job to him. This is my other friend that, you know, that, that, there's sort of a community aspect to it that I think, I mean, I, I don't think it's perfect, but in, in that sort of freelancing community, it works. Do, do you think that, I mean, you, you, what, what is your, your understanding of that as, as far as? Well, I mean, I, I, I sort of see that here and, and, and the other Creative Morning talks I've, I've been at, I mean, I think that's terrific. Look, I, I, th I think that's great. And I think it's great to be able to do your own work and to make, make your own way and not have to worry about a boss. I'm, all I'm trying to do today is to get us to step back and look at the bigger picture and think about maybe some things that we're losing or forgetting about or missing. So, I mean, as far as that goes, it's great. And it's great for you guys to be able to be here and have that kind of community. But it's also been suggested that, that uh, the designer is kind of taking over from the artist, that we have fewer and fewer artists and more and more designers, you know, and, and that's what I'm trying to remind us of. Go ahead. Can we get a beer sometime? <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can contact me through my website. Maybe we'll all go out for a beer. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly new to this city, and um, one of the things that interests me is uh, Portland has this, at least as far as I've observed it, there's this weird mix of spirituality in, in this new age hippie culture. So I'll go to the pub and someone next to me is talking about, oh yeah, we're spiritual and we're, you know, Buddhist or whatever it is, you know, all the different funky things and I, you know, you meet people who sell weird stones that shine. <laughs> um, what I'm curious about, because I'm, what I'm curious about is, how does, how, does, how does the religious impulse fit into this kind of conscious uh, new age um, <coughs> entrepreneurial, you know, small business thing? Or you can never consider I'm that. not. <laughs> um, I'm not, uh, I, I, it's not something I've thought about and I'm not exactly sure the direction of your question. It sounds to me, on second thought, like what you're saying is, that people are commodifying their spirituality as well because they're like opening yoga studios and selling uh, crystals and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like a religion. So say like you go to Starbucks, you know, you, know, you buy, I don't know if you know, uh, you go to Starbucks and you buy coffee, but you have to buy, you know, fair trade coffee. You know, right, because, right. So you're paying for the coffee, but you're also paying in a kind of conscious sense for some kind of, you know, ethic. Right, and, right, you know, right, 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 right. One thing, you just want the shoes because right. they're cool, and other people wear them and they're kind of cool, but at the same time, you're kind of buying some religion from them where okay. you're doing something good, and it's a kind right. of ethic that you're buying into. And I'm just wondering if that's a kind of... Well, uh, this may not be the, the, the kind of response you're, you're looking for, but um, what I think you're saying, I mean, in a, in a way, what I've been saying can be reformulated in sort of the terms you're hinting at, which is that um, 
everything now, like our moral and our spiritual life and you know, the things we do to save the world and the thing, can, th through uh, financial transactions, that, that's all we have time for. We have time to work and make money and we have time to spend money. And it reminds me of that book that just came out by the political scientist, I think, uh, about how you know, all values are now market values. All transactions are now market transactions. So you sort of have, get your fix of moral righteousness or self-righteousness or whatever it is, or guilt, guilt relief, with your, with your caffeine or your shoes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Money is the new religion. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Yeah. I teach design and they even have a surprisingly limited sort of history of design. Um, but in your case, you know, what do you think this sort of commodification of education is, is playing out as, <laughs> <laughs> related to your own inquiry? Yeah, I mean, that, uh, uh, that's a whole nother thing that I've been worrying and, to, you know, and writing and... Um, uh, I, I think we're, it seems that we are quickly uh, heading and, and really being pushed uh, in, a, in a very bad direction in terms of higher education and education in general, where it's all about what can be immediately negotiated, what you can walk out of college with, hand over, and get money for. And the liberal arts, humanities, curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, everything that to me college should be for is like quickly being thrown out the window. Uh, and I think ultimately it's just because people don't want to pay taxes. This is all, this all starts with a tax revolt in 1978, but that's another conversation. <laughs> it does, it really does. Thank you, thank you. Thanks.